in the same moment that we both look forward to and fear the day when you send your angels to let those who know you as God to enter your kingdom. And through your teachings and your parables, the prophecies that you shared from your mouth and that you placed on people's lips like burning coals, we know a little of what this will be like. But let your spirit be among us now as we worship your glory because of that grace and love your Father gives to us in opening the kingdom. May your holy name be praised. Amen. From the book of Psalms in the 78th one. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Our first song is called Come to the Table. And often we feel like outsiders. We feel like that we aren't allowed to be part of what God has for us. But that is completely untrue. There is the open invitation, the invitation that all we have to do is come, to lay down anything that we're holding on. Let God take it from us. We've heard the story of don't worry about tomorrow, because I can tell you no amount of worrying today can change what happened yesterday or will prepare you for what is unknown tomorrow. So coming to God, not holding on to those things that hold us back, the walls that we create that separate us, come to the table. Please rise and join us. We all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where her grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. Just when all hope seemed lost, Love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Come then and see set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these things. There's no one unwelcome here. So that's it and shame that you brought with you. You can leave it at the door and let mercy draw you near. Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. 
come to the table to the thief and to the doubter to the hero and the coward to the prisoner and the soldier to the young and to the older all who hunger all who thirst all the lights and all the first all the paupers and the princes all who fail to be forgiven all who dream and all who suffer all who loved and lost another all the chained and all the free all who follow all who lead and he To everyone who is this song, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table, to the table. Come, to come to the table. table, just sit down and rest a while, just sit down and rest a while, come to the table. next song is a brand new one that I wrote in the summer of 2020. And during that time, I'd begun to question religion as it relates to people. There were godly men and women that were constantly being unchristlike to others. They were not helping to unite a divided people. And some of that can even be seen now inside the walls of our church and even beyond that. And during that time, I kept receiving a verse in my different evening devotionals and that was Psalm 143.8. And so I'm going to read that from the NIV translation. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. And so the contemporary English version translates it as follows. Each morning, let me learn more about your love because I trust you. I come to you in prayer asking for your guidance. So I kept asking God what he was trying to tell me. Then in my morning devotional, devotional time, it was slowly unpacked. I kept getting readings based on God's unconditional love for us. God loves us with such incredible love, and he wants us to experience incredible, life-changing love, mercy, and compassion, not only from him, but from those around us. And he wants us to show that love to others. So it became very simple at that time. Love God, love others. So join us in Walk in Love.
Falling on my knees in worship, giving all I am to seek your face. Lord, all I am is yours. My whole life I place in your hands God of mercy humbled I bow down In your presence at your throne I called, you answered you and I, I want to be where you are. I'm all I find place in your eyes. God of mercy, humbled, I bow down in your presence at your throne. I called and you answered, and you came to my rescue and I. I want to be where you are, and I call and you answer, and you came to my rescue and I, I want to be And you 
came to my rescue and I, I want to be where you Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 13. It'll be verses 24 through 43. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches." Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from our, the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I told us that you would share through these parables to reveal things to us. And the psalmist wrote several centuries before Jesus was among us. He could only know that parables would be used because of prophetic vision or word. So let your spirit reveal to us now these hidden things of the kingdom through the words that you've given for me to share. The things that come into our minds so we can know our Savior Jesus more in his name. Amen. The month of February is Black History Month, and in 1926, they uh, started this as a week uh, of Black History celebration, and it was a week that was to include today, February 12th. They chose February 12th because it, was, it is the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Two days from now, February 14th, was the birthday of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and my guess is I don't really need to tell you about Abraham Lincoln, but you might not remember so much about Frederick Douglass. 
So let me tell you a little bit about him. He was born in 1818 or thereabouts. He died in February 20th, 1895, and he was an es escaped enslaved person. Uh, and when he moved to the North after escaping from slavery, he became a leader in the abolitionist movement. Uh, he wrote three autobiographies that detailed various parts of his life as an enslaved person uh, in the process of becoming free and then in freedom. He was also a pastor. Uh, he got his license to preach in 1839 from the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, a denomination that was formed in 1821 in New York City after it had splintered from the John Street Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, another denomination, had formed out of the Bethel uh, Methodist Episcopal Church a few years earlier in Philadelphia. And both the AME and the AME Zion were formed because the black members of those Methodist Episcopal congregations were experiencing discrimination and segregation in the mid-1790s, only just a couple years after John Wesley's death. And this is what led them to form their own congregations. Uh, and as the, it was uh, happening after Wesley's death because Wesley had a stance for his Methodist Episcopal churches that there wouldn't be any form of racism, discrimination, or segregation. Eventually, in 1844, the, the Methodist Episcopal Church did divide over the issue of, enslave, in, of enslavement, but they came back together in 1939 to form the Methodist Church. And this new denomination went even further in segregating congregations by actually putting the black African-American congregations into a separate conference. They called it the Central Conference, so that when the annual conferences would gather, they too were segregated. It wasn't until 1968 when the EUB and the Methodist Church merged to form the United Methodist Church that the Central Conference was abolished and there was desegregation within the church. I, I would think that looking back on that decision of the 1790s and 1820s region uh, that, they, that led to this formation of the new Methodist denominations that were uh, specifically for African Americans, I think that resulted because there was unwelcoming attitudes within the people of the, from the people of the church. And, and I feel fairly confident that Jesus was saddened over this. In the first century church, as you find it in the New Testament in Acts and in the, in the epistles, the Greeks, the Jews, the Romans, the Africans, free people, enslaved people, men, women, all were members of the same church. And in many places, the populations of, the, of this Europe and, and Middle East were very diverse. There were people from many racial and ethnic origins that were living among each other. And a lot of scholars think that the reason the first century church was so successful was because there was no segregation. And having read that comment was when I was studying last week to prepare, I began to wonder if perhaps segregated churches today play a role in the decline of the church as a whole. I remember Martin Luther King Jr. said that the, the most segregated hour uh, in, the, in the country is Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And we still see that today, don't we? Just look around at who's sitting next to you, right? So last week, we, we finished three weeks in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 to 7. Uh, and in order to cover Matthew's gospel, starting at Christmas and getting us to Easter with the resurrection, we have to skip a couple chapters. So we're skipping from chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're into 13 today. And in this chapter, Jesus is teaching. He's at the Sea of Galilee. He's got a large crowd. And he's using parables, stories that are metaphors and allegories to teach things about religion. To teach about the kingdom of heaven. And we have three parables that we're looking at today. The, the, the parable of the mustard, the parable of the leaven, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Where uh, Jesus then goes to the disciples, his, his uh, group, his small group privately, uh, to uh, explain what's going on. Uh, and in this case, the, the, uh, there's this little connector of prophecy where it's, it's according to what was written, and that's from Psalm 78, that the, the, the parables would be used to explain. And when we look at all these three parables, I, I think what we can learn is that Jesus wanted the people 
to feel welcome in his church, all people to feel welcome, so that the church would be overflowing with people who can produce fruit. So we're going to start with the mustard seed, then the leavened bread, and then the wheat and the tares. In the first parable, the, wheat, the mustard, what we'll see there is that the kingdom includes people from all backgrounds. With the leavened bread, we're going to see that it's supposed to be an abundant number of people. And the wheat and the tares is going to show us that it's about people who produce fruit and people who don't. But yet God's grace is still present with everyone. And so beginning with this parable of the mustard, it's a short parable. Only a couple verses, a couple words. And a farmer is putting mustard seed into his field. And it grows, according to the parable, into a tree that provides places to perch and nest for many birds. And he says this is like the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to break this parable down, see how does a mustard seed, the tree that it grows into, the birds, how does that relate? The mustard seed's really small. Uh, it's, it's a small seed. The plant that it grew into in Palestine, the, the species of plant that it grew into in Palestine, was a shrub of maybe six feet as most. Um, and, and farmers did grow this seed. They would collect the, the, the produce from it, and they would tithe on that. Uh, they would sell it as a spice. Now, there was another version of a seed that was of mustard, another species of seed in ancient times in bordering countries that did grow into a tree, and it was considered to be a weed. But both the tree, both the shrub mustard species would have birds nesting into them. And the, the Palestinian species grew quickly into that shrub when it would produce a lot of seeds. So it's a small seed that grows very quickly. And so one thing people understand from that parable is that the kingdom of heaven starts with something small, grows very quickly. And that's certainly true of Jesus' ministry. Twelve disciples, within a generation, the good news has spread throughout Rome, Greece, Judah, into the surrounding provinces, into northern Africa. Within a few hundred years, it had gone to Europe and to Asia. And today there's followers of Christ all over the world. But where I want to focus more today on, instead of the, the seed and the shrub or the tree, is the birds, as many Pennsylvanians are going to be doing tonight at 6.30. But to focus on the birds, I, I want to first consider Ezekiel 31. There's a prophecy in Ezekiel 31 that was given to the Egyptian pharaoh. A prophecy of Assyria, uh, the kingdom that was to the north of Israel, what's modern Lebanon. And the Assyrians, they had these really tall cedar trees. And the prophecy speaks to the Assyrians as if they're like the tall cedar trees. And in verse 6, it says, all the birds will nest in the branches. We're in Ezekiel 31. All the birds are going to rest in the branches of those trees. All the animals will lay down underneath the branches. And it says that the great nations will live under the, under the shade of the tree. Now, when we think about the Neo-Assyrian Empire of the 8th century B.C. when Ezekiel's writing, this is the largest empire in history to that point in all of time. Its boundaries ranged from as far east as Pakistan to as far west as Turkey, north to the Caspian Sea and the Ural Mountains, and south to Sudan. In other words, it's the bulk of the Middle East. And there were several million people living in the regions that were part of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And if we understand birds to mean the nations of that Neo-Assyrian nation in the prophecies of Ezekiel, then we take that into the context of the New Testament and Jesus' message being for the Gentiles. When he's talking about the shrub, that the, the mustard that all the birds are going to nest in, what he means is that the kingdom of heaven is for all people. Now if we go to the parable of leaven, even a shorter parable than the mustard seed, the next thing we want to find out for today. Now, leaven, if you're not familiar with that word, the New King James sometimes uses, uh, they use the antiquated words every now and then, even though they updated the language. Leaven is yeast. And yeast is mixed into the bread. It causes the dough to rise. They discovered this as early as 2000 BC in ancient Egypt. But it takes time for a loaf of bread, of, of dough, to rise. And the ancient Egyptians very commonly put yeast into their dough. So the Israelites who lived there, they would have learned that practice. But when they fled from Egypt, according to the Old Testament, they were commanded to, break, uh, to bake the unleavened bread, bread without yeast. And the practical reason behind God giving that command is that it takes less time to prepare. 
So later when they're given God's law, they're told, eat the unleavened bread during the festivals. In fact, clean your whole house to remove any of the yeast before the Passover feast to be sure your bread isn't contaminated with the yeast. And that created a connection with purity. <clears throat> purity was rather important in Israelite pr religious practices. The peoples, the house, the food, the unblemished sacrificial animals, the clean clothing, all of it to represent the moral purity that the people are to maintain. So that connection's a little difficult in light of the kingdom of God. It, it, Jesus is saying in this parable that the, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast mixed into flour. If we just think about Jewish festivals, well, that would seem like impurity. It, it, is Jesus trying to say the kingdom of heaven is impure? Let me come back to that in a moment. The other part of the parable that's notable is the amount of flour that's used. It says three measures of flour. Now, when you go to Genesis 18, you find that three measures of flour again. Abraham's visited by three travelers. The three travelers arrive. Abraham says to Sarah to prepare the meal, to prepare the bread, to use three measures of flour. The visitors tell Sarah that she's going to become pregnant. She laughs about it. The child gets named as Isaac, which means uh, laughter. After they depart, Abraham finds out who they are. One of the three travelers is God. What's important about the three measures? If you were to take three measures of flour and bake bread, you have enough bread to feed a hundred people. And so when we look at the rest of the meal, Abraham also adds to that bread, a hundred people's worth of bread. He adds veal, he adds milk, he adds cheese. This is an elaborate meal that he's serving to them. So much more than is needed for three guests, Abraham and his wife. And so by stating three measures of flour in the parable, what Jesus is letting us know is there's a great abundance in the kingdom. Now let's come back to the impurity part. I want us to remember none of us is without sin, right? No human person who's ever lived except for Jesus himself was without sin. And so if it's true that no one who's sinful can be in the presence of God, then how can there be abundance of people in the kingdom unless sinful people get to enter? Well, of course, the good news is that sinful people do enter the kingdom of heaven because Jesus Christ gives us grace through his death and through his resurrection. So, again, does the kingdom of heaven have impurities in it? Well, yes, because the people who are impure, but we have to remember that those impurities are covered by the blood of Christ. And so, thankfully, even with our impurities, Jesus lets an abundant number of people into heaven. I want to jump back to the wheat and the tares, the longer of the three parables. It's one of a handful of parables that Jesus actually explained so it could be clearly understood in the way that he intended it. A field where the master plants good seed. The master is, to, is Jesus, the son of man. The field is the earth. The seeds are the believers, God's children. The servants discover enemies have had, an enemy had put weeds into the field, and the enemy is the devil. The weeds are evil people, people who don't believe. Well, the servants want to get rid of the weeds. The master says, wait. Because the harvest will come, and when that happens, the wheat and the weeds are going to be sorted out. And the harvesters are the angels. And when the sorting happens, the weeds get burned up. The question left unanswered is, by Jesus' explanation is, why does the master want to leave the weeds? He says it's going to pull up the, the, the wheat. But let me add some contextual information about wheat and weeds. The biblical scholars believe that the specific type of weed that's being talked about here uh, is a weed called darnel, a weed that looks identical to the wheat until the grains start to form. What, what it would be like tonight if both teams wore the same uniforms, right? The quarterback wouldn't know who was who until he threw the ball, and then the receiver runs towards the, uh, the end zone of the quarterback or back towards the quarterback to go the other direction, Right? The grains of wheat and the weeds look exactly the same, and no one knows the difference. Until they start to mature, the wheat starts to bend over because of the weight of the grains. But the Darnell weed doesn't get a grain head that's heavy enough to cause that. So you can't know until harvest time. And the weeds and the uh, wheat, the roots get intertwined. So if you pull up the weeds, you pluck up the good wheat. So what does this parable mean for the church today? It means there's going to be people in the church who are not believers. They might look 
and act exactly the same. They might even say the same things as Christians. But we, who are the servants, aren't given the task of weeding out those who are not believers. Instead, we're just told, let them remain among us. Let God sort it out. I think that the reason God needs us to do this needs to be understood in the context of miracles. Look, if God can do the miracle of creation from nothing, if God can do the miracle of taking water and making it into wine, if God can do the miracle of taking the paralyzed person, getting them up to give them the ability to walk, or make the blind person see, then why can't God turn a weed into a fruit-producing plant? Well, God can do the miracle of turning a, a, a non-believer who's sinful into a believer whose sins are forgiven by grace. And what that means for us in the church is that it needs to be open to everyone because everyone might become a follower of God. The church and the kingdom of heaven are open to everyone. It doesn't matter someone's race or ethnicity. God wants the church to open to them. In fact, the book of Acts tells us, remember, I said it's the most, one of the most successful times in the church. It was open to everyone. And if you look at the history of the church in the U.S., there were a couple periods of history where the church grew wildly. Times when the church wasn't segregated, in fact. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, the church grew substantially in the north where churches were, were desegregated, especially. In the Pentecostal movement of 100 years ago, in the early 1900s, 120 years ago, starting in California, and it was initially a movement that involved people of all races. The birds and the mustard shrubs show Jesus intended that his church is like this. The yeast in the dough lets us know that even though there's impurities in it, it's mixed in and it's abundant. That, that's letting us know God opens the kingdom of heaven to everyone regardless of the choices they've made. As long as they have that one critical choice to accept God. And it's the grace of Jesus Christ that makes it possible. And the wheat and the tares are letting us know the church has to be open to, to everyone regardless of their choices. Regardless of their current level of commitment to God. Re whether they've accepted God or not. Whether they're actively engaged in sin or not. God can and does perform miracles that make it possible that they become those who are later allowed into the kingdom. But there's this ugly truth that sometimes people feel unwelcome in the church. And maybe it's because they're of a race or ethnicity that's different from the majority of the church. The actions, the words, the vibes given off. It causes people to feel unwelcome, whether you intend to or not. And likewise, very often the church has determinations about what kind of worst sins are. And it causes people to feel like they aren't welcome. Again, because of the actions, the vibes, the words that make them feel that way. So what do we want to do if we want to follow what Jesus wanted? Well, remember I said that the main point today is Jesus wants people, all people, to feel welcome in his church so it would be overflowing with people who produce fruit. We have to become like that. We have to be the people who produce fruit. This shows people that they're welcome. We have to be aware of our actions, of our words, aware of the ways that we come across to other people. That involves a self-exploration that might be very difficult. A self-exploration that allows you to become more aware of your unconscious beliefs and biases that you carry. If we don't make these kinds of changes, we continue to be the kind of people who come across as unwelcome. We don't succeed in making the local church be the church where people feel welcome, everyone feels welcome in God's church so that it becomes overflowing with people who produce fruit. Amen. I want to take time and as we come towards the end of the service again, as I always do, to pray for needs that you may have. Um, I want to remind us, if you need a, a prayer request, um, just reach out to, to Sandy. She gets it on the prayer chain. Uh, you can reach out to me and I can forward it to her. You can call me and leave me a message in the office and it will come to my email and I can uh, be in prayer for you. So whatever your specific needs are or the needs of your friends and family, let's pray for them today. Father God, your son taught us your kingdom is for everyone. It's for an abundant number of people. That your church is to be open to everyone. So Lord, I ask that you forgive us for our failures and how we make the church uh, seem welcoming. We are all in need of your grace. 
We need it. We ask that you would give mercy for every one of our burdens. We ask for your grace and mercy on all who we pray for. People with chronic and acute illness, with pain and suffering, suffering in their minds and spirits. Those who are impoverished in both bank accounts and in the spiritual realm. People who deal with grief over recent losses and even those of long ago. Fears of our own mortality and anxiety over those who are left behind who are going to mourn and so much more. So we pray, Lord, that you're going to be with them, that your spirit's going to fill them with a sense of calm, that they know that you are God who loves them deeply, even in the midst of their suffering. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, using his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we pray over your offering, don't forget the offering baskets in the back. And if you're joining us online, you can give at talkingdurford.church slash give. Let's pray a special blessing over the gifts we give. Jesus. We want to make sure that the church is open and welcoming to an abundant number of people. It is your spirit that will make this possible. Bless our gifts and the ministry of the church. Let this church be a place where people will flock and fill it, just as the mustard plants branches are filled with birds. Let them be abundant, just as three measures of flour rise when yeast is mixed in. Our gifts are making it possible that we can reach people, but we pray that we would reach more and the gifts would be multiplied. And as we pray this, we will continue to praise you. Amen. Our next song is called Life Song. And as we heard in the message, there's a lot of times that you can put on a mask. You can act like you are something you are not. But it comes in the end that the fruits of your life will show who you truly were. So what better way to do it than to have your life song be one that praises God. The song of a true follower, one who seeks to be his even when we mess up. And so I invite you to all rise and join us in Life Song. Empty hands held high Such a small sacrifice Not join with my life I sing in vain tonight May the words I say And the things I do Make my life so sing Bring a smile to you. Let my last song sing to you. Let my last song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day. No, let my was true let my last song sing to you Lord I give my life living sacrifice to reach a world in need 
be your hands and feet. May the words I say and the things I do make my life so sweet. Bring a smile to you. Let my life so sweet to you. Let my life so sign your name to the end of the stand or let my heart push through let my last song sing to you hallelujah hallelujah let my life song sing Just as you have been welcomed into the family of God, you're called to welcome others. And, and we might think we can't do this alone, but thankfully God is with us in it. 
So we need to let the Father, the Son, and the Spirit lead us. Amen.